<laughs> I used to be rather childish, but then again, who wasn't? We were all children once. But have you noticed that some adults never seem to really grow up? They remain childish, and I don't mean that in an innocent, carefree way. Rather, they can be petulant when they don't get what they want, and they're not the center of attention. And we call them immature, because that's what they are. They're big babies. But we can all be big babies, especially when we're thinking about our own problems. And I want to explain why that's the case and what we can do about it. We all start as egocentric children. This was a term used by the great Swiss child psychologist, Jean Piaget, to describe the way the child sees the world with his self or his ego at the center looking outwards. Not only does the egocentric child sort of see the world from only this perspective, but they assume that others share that same view as well. Moreover, they also believe that others have the same ideas, the same beliefs and thoughts. So in theory of mind tasks, for example, when asked to consider what another person is thinking or what's on their mind, the egocentric child will just extrapolate from what they know and assume that others have exactly the same thoughts. If I show an egocentric three-year-old this tube of Smarties and ask what's inside here, then in all likelihood they'll say Smarties or M&Ms if they're American. If I then open it up to reveal that, in fact, it contains not Smarties but pencils, well, first of all, children find this absolutely hilarious. It really is that easy to entertain a three-year-old. But if I ask them, what did you think was in here before I showed you? The three-year-old will say, pencils seemingly having forgotten just a moment ago that they had a mistaken, or what we say in psychology, a false belief. Now that's interesting, but what's more surprising is that if you ask them what will another child say, Mary, what will she say if I ask her what's inside here, having not seen it, then the egocentric child says that Mary thinks there'll be pencils inside there, as if somehow Mary knows the true state of the world and can read the child's own mind. And we do know other egocentric adults who assume that everyone can know exactly what they're thinking. Or consider the classic Piagetian Three Mountains task. In that situation, a child sits at a table and on the opposite side is another child or an adult. And on the table, you have a model of three paper mache mountains of different sizes and different shapes and different colors, each with a distinguishing landmark. You can take photographs of the model from around the table at different angles, and then lay these out as an array of photographs. If you ask the child to pick the photograph that corresponds to the view that they can see, they find this trivially easy. But if you ask them to choose a photograph that corresponds to the view from the other side of the table, what the other person can see, then the egocentric child persists in selecting their own perspective again, ignoring what the other person must be seeing, a mirror image. And finally, and most amusingly, don't be surprised if you're playing hide-and-seek with an egocentric child, if they run over to hide by standing in the corner and picking up a waste paper basket and then pulling it over their head, or taking a blanket and throwing it over their head, or simply standing in the middle of the room and covering their eyes with their hands. Why? Well, they think if they can't see you, well, it stands to reason, you can't see them. Now, if you're an individual who thinks that everyone sees the world the same way as you do and has the same thoughts and ideas and beliefs, then that's going to present considerable obstacles to being and getting along with others who don't share the same ideas, beliefs, or views of the world. In order to be accepted and socialized, a child has to put aside their egocentric bias and adopt a more allocentric perspective, capable of seeing things from a different angle, as it were. Now, with development, children do get accepted. They do become socialized. They do cooperate and communicate with others. But it's not entirely clear that this egocentric bias ever entirely goes away. Like many thoughts and behaviors I've studied over the years, I think that these become dormant or latent, and they're always with us. They're little they're a little bit like the um, infantile reflexes that we're all born with. These are motor reflexes, such as the grasp reflex or other reflexes, which serve a purpose. But as we develop in age, they disappear, or at least they appear to disappear. But in fact, they don't. 
Rather, they become suppressed or inhibited by the development of the cortical mechanisms of the brain, which mature much later in development, in particular the prefrontal cortical areas. These areas exert executive function or control, and they operate to self-regulate our thoughts and behaviors. So if you're an adult, unfortunately, if you have some cortical damage, such as being in a coma, you can see the re-emergence of these early ways of thinking and behaving. You can see the re-emergence of the infantile grasp reflex, for example. Now, I think this explains why in very young children who don't have mature cortical mechanisms, why they become slaves to their impulses and urges, which is why they have temper tantrums or have behavioral meltdown. But it's not just children who can have a behavioral meltdown. We've heard about CEOs in the boardroom throwing their toys out of the pram, and we've recently seen some very famous celebrities behaving in very childish ways in public arenas. In fact, we can all behave like that. You simply have to put someone under stress. So, for example, if you put adults in a situation where they don't think they have control, then they perform much worse on those theory of mind tasks I mentioned, and even versions of the three mountains task. In short, under stress, we regress. Now, I think this explains why we have such long childhoods, the longest proportional childhoods of any animal on the planet. Of course, our childhoods were shorter centuries ago, getting married at 14 and working at 8, but that's because life expectancy was much shorter. Today, with our much longer lifespans of 80 years or so, nevertheless, we still spend about a fifth of that lifespan learning to become independent adults learning to become less dependent on our parents and connected with others, independent but also interdependent. Because that's how our species developed, a highly social animal that learns from others around us. And this is why we are so compelled to be part of a group and why the prospect of being isolated or excluded is such emotionally damaging to most people. But it's not just emotionally damaging is also physically very dangerous for us. For example, loneliness is well recognized as a contributing factor to the earlier death in many elderly people. The morbidity risk associated with loneliness is higher than moderate smoking and even obesity. So it's imperative that we're accepted. It's imperative that we form these social relationships. Now, you might imagine that with the development of the internet and the popularity of social media, the opportunities for forming social relationships is enhanced. But in many ways, social media has become anti-social media. And the reason is, is because it's making us more egocentric again. So hands up and be honest now. Hands up if you've ever Googled yourself. Okay, hands up if you've ever taken a selfie. And the reason we do this, of course, is because of the need to be recognized, the, re the need to be validated. We do this because we don't want to be excluded. We become hypersensitive to the possibility that maybe we're missing out on things, which leads to this well-known phenomenon of FOMO, the fear of missing out. And when that prospect emerges, we become insecure, and we become vulnerable to the curse of the self. Because when we're focused on ourself, we have a very egocentric view, and we amplify and blow everything out of proportion. Our problems just seem immense in comparison to everything else. And so in order to become a happier person, we've got to learn to adopt a different perspective and put a distance between ourselves and our problems. And I want to demonstrate that now with a little bit of audience participation. I want you all to think of a problem, not a global problem, but a problem which is specific to you a personal problem. Maybe it's financial. Maybe somebody said something horrible to you. Maybe it was a relationship which isn't quite working out. Whatever it is, I want you to talk about that problem in a moment. But I know this is a public auditorium, so I don't want you to speak out loud. Rather, I want you to use your inner voice. Or if you're watching this as a recorded video, you can speak out loud. But today, just use your inner voice to talk about the problem in the following way, with the following statements because I want you to refer to your problem using the first person terms of I and me. So I'll give myself as an example. I am worried about my TEDx talk because 
I don't think the audience is enjoying it, and that upsets me. Your turn. I am thinking about whatever my problem is because of the consequences, and this upsets you. Do that now. Okay, so how does that make you feel? Probably not too great because, first of all, I've just reminded you of a problem that you'd probably forgotten about. I've made you focus on it, and I've reminded you and made you recognize and acknowledge how unhappy it's going to make you. What a jerk I am. But don't worry, I have a quick fix. I want you to do the same thing again, but this time, don't use any first-person terms. I want you to use non-first-person non terms of he and she or him and her, and most importantly, I want you to use your own name. So going back to my example, Bruce is worried about his TEDx talk because he thinks that the audience doesn't like it, and this upsets him. Your turn with your problem. Do that now. Okay, so how does that make you feel in comparison? Compared to talking about it in the first uh, person condition, which did you find less stressful? Put your hands up if you thought talking about your problem in the first person was less stressful. Okay. And put your hands up if you thought talking about your problem in the third person was less stressful. Great. And this is typically what we find. Around about eight or nine people in the audiences I've tried this exercise with find that talking about and reflecting upon your problem in the third person is somehow a lot less distressing than talking about it in the first person. And this is called psychological distancing. It's a technique that's been explored by the psychologist Ethan Cross as a way of modulating your emotional reaction, regulating it. In fact, it can be used to prepare for stressful situations. In one of his studies, he had students uh, sprung upon with an unexpected task of speaking in public, and they were told this was going to be a really important presentation, and they were going to be judged on it. And for one half of the students, he told to them to prepare for it using the first-person terms. And in the other group, he asked them to reflect upon the upcoming talk using third-person terms. And what he found was that on self-reports, the students had, who had prepared using the third person found the experience actually a lot less stressful. But what was more interesting was that independent judges who didn't know what condition each student had been entered into also rated the students who had prepared using third person as coming over as much more relaxed, more confident, and convincing. So this is not just good for the individual. It provides you with the skills to present yourself. So what's going on here? Well, we normally never speak about ourselves in the third person. The only people that do that are royalty when they say, we are not amused. Rather, we use the first person terms of I because that's how we experience the stream of consciousness from the first person perspective. When we're referring to another person, then of course we use the third person. So when you speak about yourself in the third person, this automatically transposes you from an egocentric perspective into one which is allocentric. It puts a distance between yourself and your problem. It's a little bit like talking to a friend or consoling a colleague. Now, you might feel bad for their problem, but you don't feel anywhere near as bad as if you were the person experiencing it. So this psychological distancing helps you with this. Now, I've been teaching a course called the science of happiness here at the University of Bristol. And in this course, we cover the theory behind the, what makes us happy, some of the, the psychology, some of the physiology, but we also get the students to practice positive psychology interventions. And I've come to realize that all of these interventions, to a greater or lesser extent, work probably because they introduce this distancing effect. In other words, they shift us from a very egocentric to a more allocentric perspective, either directly or indirectly. Directly in the case of, for example, doing an act of kindness or some form of altruism where your attention is directed towards someone else. But even more contemplative acts, such as meditation or going for a walk in nature or experiencing awe, I think these work because they shift this egocentric view on our problems and direct it out towards the world around us. And this puts a distance between us. You know, one of the most awesome things you can do, apparently, is to go into space and look back at our planet. 
It's said to produce the most profound emotional experience called the overview effect. And I think this is the ultimate in psychological distancing because if you're in the International Space Station orbiting the planet, then your problems back on Earth are 250 miles away. And if you look in the other direction, you can see the vast expanse of the universe. So everything is put into perspective. To paraphrase the astronaut Ed Gibson, when you look back at your planet, then your life and your concerns seem diminutive in comparison to the size of the universe. Now, I doubt I will ever make it into space, but maybe some of you will. But for the rest of us back down on Earth, we can all experience a better, healthier mental life. We simply have to remember to try and shift our perspective to become more allocentric. We have to grow up and stop being big babies. Thank you. <laughs>